Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at the various types of punishment for offenders that, is off, that are often used within the correctional system. Um, before we go through each of the major types of punishment, we're going to take a brief look at the number of adults under correctional control in the United States, both currently as well as looking historically, so we can see some of the changes and trends over time. We will then proceed into looking at various types of punishment. Um, as you can see, we will start with sort of what are known as community-based sanctions or community corrections. And these include things like probation and intermediate sanctions. Uh, that we will then move into sort of the two classic sort of forms of incarceration um, by looking briefly at jails, what they are, how they operate, as well as the same approach with the prisons and the prison system. Um, we'll then move on to briefly looking at the death penalty, otherwise known as capital punishment, and then we'll finish off the lecture by taking a look at what are known as the back end of community corrections, which includes parole. The reading that corresponds to this particular le lecture is uh, chapter four of your course textbook. So let's go ahead and get started. So looking at this slide, what, what do we see here? Well, this is the incarceration, excuse me, incarceration rate of inmates um, incarcerated under both state and federal jurisdiction per 100,000 in the population over roughly the last century. Obviously, it ends at 2014, but 1925 up through 2014. What I want us to focus on primarily is that red line right there in the middle. And you'll notice there's three different lines. The top one, the purplish line, represents males that were incarcerated. The bottom line, the green, represents females who were incarcerated. But that red line is sort of captures both, both genders and the overall incarceration rate. And what you'll see here is from the far left of this particular diagram, around 1925, all the way up until almost 1975. If you look at it, it's a pretty steady line. I mean, there's a couple blips there right, um, right before 1940, and then it settled back down. But for the most part, we see a pretty steady line from, you know, for roughly 50 years, from about 1925 to 1975, where we found that the incarceration rate in the United States was roughly 100 out of every 100,000 adults. Um, and we'll talk later in the class about why this may be, why it remains so steady for 50 years straight. And then surprisingly, and perhaps most alarmingly, what is what happened starting in the mid-70s, right up until around 2007, 2008. That's where we see what has led to sort of our prison industrial complex um, and our, our just booming correctional system in the United States. If you look at that red line, we don't just see an increase starting around 1975, but rather we see an exponential climb as far as the rate of incarceration in the United States. States, where by the time we get to the early 2000s, the rate of incarceration is over 500 individuals per 100,000. That's a five-fold increase over just a few decades. And one of the things we're going to be talking about and paying quite a bit of attention to this semester is why. What led to that massive spike in incarceration rate? And we'll talk about the various laws and policies and, you know, uh, tough on crime, truth in sentencing, three strikes laws, mandatory minimums, things like that that you'll become aware of that led to this overwhelming spike in our incarceration rate. Um, but the good news is the last decade or so, we've actually started to slowly reverse that trend. And from about 2008 um, until now, um, we've noticed that we're starting to level off and actually starting to see a little bit of a dip. Now this slide only shows from 2008 to 2018, and obviously it's also, it's not exactly the same lines representing what we saw on the previous slide, but if you take a look at it, it, get, it gives us an idea of what we're starting to notice is we're finally starting, if we look at that red line that um, at the top, the total, the persons under supervision of adult correctional systems, we're finally starting to see a decrease. Um, and so this means that either we've changed our habits as far as punishment and corrections goes, um, or we're getting better, or maybe we're missing individuals. And we'll, we'll sort of unwrap all the layers of this going forward. Um, but for the most part, one of the nice things and sort of the silver lining is we are seeing somewhat of an easing on our correctional system um, over the last decade where we don't have quite the same amount of prison and jail overcrowding, et cetera. Um, so sort of the two takeaways that I really want to make sure you 
pay attention to on these past two slides is one is that market increase that we saw that five fold increase that we saw from the mid 1970s up until the first decade of the 2000s um, and then the second part is what I mentioned before is maybe a bit of a silver lining has been that rough decrease over roughly the past decade or 12 years or so um, and that's something that we're going to try to explain and account for as we talk about um, the correctional system in more detail going forward. Now this slide inc includes, there's a lot going on here, so take your time, read through it. Um, the source for this material that's also used on several other um, slides throughout this presentation is listed there at the bottom. Um, but one of the things this sort of gets at is it talks about some of the areas in which we've seen a decrease since 2008 as far as our correctional, super, correctional um, numbers and the overall correctional supervision rates. And then you can see here that the first one, that the adult correctional supervision rate has decreased over 20%. Um, the percentage of U.S. adults under correctional supervision was actually lower in 2018 than at any time since 1992. Um, we notice also that the adult incarceration rate has declined every year since 2008. So it wasn't just a blip. We've seen at least a decade or 12 year plus um, sort of downward trend. And the rate in 2018 was actually the lowest since 1996. So what we're seeing here is we're actually seeing a major change in how our correctional system is working. Now, this isn't a precipitous drop, but it's definitely finally fixing that major spike that we saw um, from 19, mid 1970s until around 2007 and 2008. So now that we have a look at sort of the trends of what we've seen as far as overall correctional populations over the last almost century here in America, let's take a brief look at well, what exactly, what are the components of the correctional system? What are the major sort of things when we think about the types of punishment that are handed out to offenders? So as I mentioned on the very first slide, we're going to start with the area called community corrections or front end community corrections. And the oldest and probably most basic of this is known as probation. So what is probation? Well, probation is when in lieu of imprisonment or incarceration, an offender is allowed to live in the community under correctional supervision so long as that individual abides by all laws. So probation, and we'll talk about the history of probation here in the United States in a later lecture, but pro probation was sort of meant to punish individuals with something a little bit harsher than a minor, a fine, or maybe even a little bit of community service, but for individuals who don't, aren't necessarily needing to be locked up. Um, we, we feel that jail or prison is too harsh of a punishment for them. So probation is a big catch-all that covers a lot of individuals under correctional control in the United States. And as we'll be talking about, we'll notice that probation in and of itself is only one of the many forms of sort of front-end community corrections. When we look, thinking about the numbers of individuals on probation, in 2008, we saw four point, almost 4.3 million U.S. adults were on, under probation control. By 2018, we saw that drop, similar to the drop that we've seen on the uh, previous slides. We have seen this decrease in the number of adults on probation, and that equates to a 17.1% decrease in the number of adults on probation. So we're having less individuals punished on probation. And for all of these, one of the things I want you to think about is we mentioned in the previous lecture about the corrections being a system, right? There's no way that you impact one component of the system without having a larger impact on other components. So this reduction in the number of individuals on probation, well, does that mean that we're sending more people to jail or prison? We'll take a look at that in a moment. Or does it mean that maybe we're not punishing people as severely? Um, maybe we're working more with other sort of alternative forms of um, punishment as opposed to official correctional probation. Um, these are things that we'll have to sort of answer to figure out, well, where did these individuals go? Um, it's not necessarily that people just stopped committing crime. I mean, that could be part of the equation, but it's probably not going to explain the overall decrease. And when we think about community corrections, oftentimes people talk about how it fits into what we call a continuum of sanctions. 
So community corrections, which includes probation, as well as intermediate sanctions that we'll see on the next slide, exist between the extremes of benign responses, basically allowing people to get away with criminal behavior, and overly harsh punitiveness, right? We want to sort of have a nice array of different types of punishments that sort of fit the particular crime that somebody may engage in. And this idea of this continuum of sanctions also goes back to an idea that was um, a, a term that was coined several decades ago known as the panacea pendulum. And most of you probably know the idea of a pendulum, a big swinging object going back and forth. And a panacea, if you're not familiar with what a panacea is, it, it, is, it means a cure-all, an elixir that will fix whatever ails you. And even in the correctional system for you know, decades, if not centuries, individuals and researchers and policymakers have been looking for that panacea for the crime problem. How do we punish people to protect society and also reduce crime rates? What is the best approach to corrections and punishment? So Finkenauer in 1982 sort of coined this panacea pendulum term with this explanation. And his argument was, this panacea phenomenon is characterized by a cycle of unrealistic expectations, failures and dissatisfaction with the proposed cure-all, and ultimately a renewed search for yet another foolproof elixir for the crime problem. All right, so what is he saying here? One of the things that we're going to be discovering this semester is that from one time period to another, we're always looking for the cure-all, the way to fix the crime problem. How do we punish effectively and also reduce crime? And so there's time periods where there's a big belief in rehabilitation and therapy and diversions to typical punishment, and that becomes the, the popular idea at the time. And then eventually people start to get dissatisfied with the ineffectiveness of therapy or, or rehabilitation and we see a shift and the, the pendulum shifts in another way. And then people may start to call for getting tough on crime, mandatory minimums, harsher punishments, and then we see the pendulum swift, uh, shift in that way. And then unfortunately, as is always the case with human history, we get frustrated with that. Uh, maybe we see the prison populations going up, but yet maybe we don't see crime rates going down. Um, and so we lose interest in that particular cure-all and then the pendulum shifts back. So hopefully you kind of get that idea. And it's one of these ever, it's an eternal battle that is part of handling punishment and understanding the correctional system. There's always going to be shifts. Those shifts may come within a year or two of each other, or it may take decades before that shift occurs, but there's a constant sort of momentum of always looking for the cure-all, the panacea. So intermediate sanctions. Intermediate, intermediate sanctions are also part of those front end um, community corrections. And sort of the history of intermediate sanctions goes that probation was seen as a good way to punish individuals, allow them to stay in the community. They can live at home, they can work, um, they can provide for their family as long as they report to their probation officer and abide by the rules. And then the next leap was, well, if they don't abide by the rules, let's lock them up, let's throw them in jail. But there's a big gap there between standard probation and a jail or prison sentence. And so, especially during the 1960s and 70s, the use of intermediate sanctions became very popular. And what these are is all different types of punishment that just sort of fit to fill the gaps between standard probation and incarceration in jail or prison. So if we look at sort of a range of sanctions that might be handed out by the um, correctional system or the criminal justice system, we see, you know, you get a, a parking ticket or a speeding ticket and maybe you have to pay some fines. Um, other times you may get um, busted for doing something and you've got to do a couple hours of community service. Um, maybe if it is a drug-related or alcohol-related crime, but it's at a minor level, maybe there is mandatory um, attendance at treatment programs or meetings of some sort. Um, then we have probation, right? And probation was that sort of first sort of what we think of like, you know, common correctional approach. But in between there, all these things here in yellow are just some examples of what researchers would typically refer to as intermediate sanctions. They're a little bit harsher than standard probation, but yet you're still not being locked up in jail or prison. So sometimes they may have probation coupled with 
um, mandatory treatment or community service or other mandatory things that the individual has to complete in order to um, fulfill their punishment. Sometimes we have individuals under what is known as intensive probation. Um, so these may be individuals who have a history of criminal behavior or maybe the crime they committed is one that is um, not quite deserving of jail or prison, but is serious enough that we need to pay more attention to those individuals. So sometimes there are, you know, special caseloads for sex offenders um, who are on probation, um, gang related crimes that may be on probation, where under that intensive probation, you may have to meet with your probation officer much more frequently than standard probation. You may have to submit to drug tests on a regular basis. You may have more home visits by your probation officer and you may have other sort of requirements such as treatment, pain, um, restitution, pr providing community service, things that sort of amp up the intensity of the probation. Then in today's day and age where we have opportunities for um, electronic monitoring and GPS um, ankle bracelets and things of that nature, sometimes we have home confinement or electronic monitoring where we don't deem that you're enough of a risk where we need to lock you up in jail or prison to serve your time, but we don't really want you out on the streets walking the neighborhood on a regular basis. So maybe you've got GPS monitoring which limits your where you can go or home confinement. Um, then some of the other forms of intermediate sanctions that have sort of had popularities at various times include things like boot camp and shock incarceration. Um, so boot camp, maybe you're not locked up, but you're pretty much sent to go do almost a militaristic style training um, as part of your punishment for a, you know, several weeks or several months. Um, and these are often things like boot camp and shock incarceration are often used with younger or first time offenders almost to sort of set them straight, quote unquote, um, or to, you know, scare them straight, quote unquote. Um, so shock incarceration, the idea is not they're not going to shock you with electrical shocks, but it may be you are locked up in a jail setting for a short period of time on the weekends um, or something in that nature, especially for younger offenders to see just what it's like to be locked up, even for 24 to 48 hours may sort of shock them into realizing um, the difficulties and what type of punishment incarceration can really be. And then as we move beyond there, we move on to our, some of our other more classic forms of punishment, such as jail and prison that we'll be talking about here in a second. So intermediate sanctions, we could spend an entire lecture talking about all the different versions that have come across over the years. But pretty much anything that's a little bit harsher than probation, but isn't quite as harsh as a you know um, standard jail sentence can sort of fall into this realm of intermediate sanctions. Now let's take a look at jail. Jail in and of itself, historically, the definition is these are facilities designed to hold pre-trial detainees, sentenced misdemeanants, and individuals convicted of felonies. Ah, but you see an asterisk about that last point, when prison space is unavailable. So jails historically are not meant for long-term incarceration. Jails are meant to hold individuals for days, weeks, months, or maybe a year to two. That's kind of what they're designed for. They don't have the sleeping quarters or the exercise facilities or the opportunity for educational or treatment programs that larger prisons do. And that's not what jails were ever meant to be used for. They were meant to hold people who were awaiting trial, pre-trial detainees. They were supposed to hold people who had been convicted of lower level crimes, misdemeanors, as opposed to felonies, so sentenced misdemeanors. And then when there's little to no space in our prison systems, they have been forced to sometimes hold individuals who are serving a short felony sentence. And we'll talk about this in much greater detail going forward, especially here in California, where we've seen over the last... Um, you know, 10 to 15 years, a major push and emphasis and burdens have been placed on our jail system, so much so that now it's common for um, oftentimes lower level felony offenders to serve a one to three year quote unquote prison sentence in a local jail. So we'll talk about the burdens that this has placed on jails and how it's changed the culture and the climate of the jails. 
I've already mentioned the idea that they're not designed for rehabilitation or therapy or treatment or education. So we're already missing out on that opportunity other than just having a place to hold individuals. But also when we think about who runs and administers jails. Well, jails are typically administered and run by counties. So it's, you don't have wardens and correctional officers working in jails. Rather, what you have in jails are the law enforcement individuals at the county level, so county sheriffs. So jails are usually run by sheriff's deputies. Um, and it's not too uncommon that oftentimes individuals right after they've come out of the academy and gotten hired by Los Angeles County Sheriff or Orange County Sheriff or Riverside County Sheriff to spend the first several years working within the jail systems before they're out patrolling the streets. Um, so not only do you have individuals who typically are designed and trained more for law enforcement handling these jails, but they're often also individuals who are newer to the force. Um, so you can imagine the dynamic changes when all of a sudden you're not just holding individuals for a couple months. But if you're being forced to hold individuals in jails for a year to two to three years, you can see how that adds burden and changes the dynamic of the jail system. So what are our numbers in the jails look like? Well, in 2008, there were approximately 786,000 US adults in um, jails within the United States. With, by 2018, we saw a decrease. So just like we saw a decrease in probation, we've also seen a decrease in our jail population. Not as much of a decrease in the jail population. You may recall from a previous slide, for probation, it was around 17% decrease. Jails have only seen about a 6% decrease. But even so, we've seen a reduction here as well. Then we move on to sort of the granddaddy of them all. Whenever we think about a corrections class, and as soon as you tell somebody, I'm taking a, a class on the correctional system or corrections in a singular sense, people automatically assume it's all about prisons. Yes, prisons are sort of the cornerstone, especially here in America, of the correctional system. But as you've already started to see, they're, they're just one slice of the pie. So what are prisons historically? Well, they are institutions for the incarceration of people convicted of serious crimes, typically felonies, right? So if we have lower level crimes or misdemeanors, we have higher level crimes, which are felonies. Felonies are crimes that are by statute designed to receive a punishment of a year or more in, of incarceration. Further, when it comes to prisons, we sort of think of two sort of types of prisons that exist side by side here in the United States. We have state prisons, which are state run and handle individuals convicted of state and local laws. So here in California, we have over 30 state institutions or state prisons. But also alongside those, we have federal prisons. Now federal prisons aren't as numerous across the United States or even in, you know, in California, we only have a handful of, of federal prisons, but yet they off operate oftentimes in a similar fashion as state prisons, but they are designed to be run by the federal system and handle individuals convicted of federal crimes. So although you may see similarities between both state and federal prisons that we'll talk about in more detail later, one of the things we have to think about is, well, one of the glaring differences is who funds them, right? State prisons are typically funded and run by state government. Um, whereas federal, pris pr federal prisons have access to federal, the federal budget and are run by our federal government through Washington, D.C. Um, and also the types of crimes that individuals are convicted of differ whether or not they are convicted of a state or local law versus a federal law. So let's take a look at how the prison population has changed over the last you know, 10, 12 years. So in 2008, there were 1.6 million US adults incarcerated in state or federal prisons. And a decade later in 2018, we once again, we see another area where we've seen a decline. We see it, it drop down to about 1.47 million US adults, which is almost a 9% decrease. So, so far, what we're seeing here is we've seen, as far as our correctional system goes, we've seen decreases in probation, decreases in jail populations, and decreases in prison populations. So clearly it's showing us that it's a different manner in which we are um, punishing individuals. Does it tie to a reduction in the crime rate? Perhaps. Does it tie to a change in philosophies? Going back to that 
panacea pendulum? Are we uh, trying different approaches that don't involve the classic probation, jail, and prison? Perhaps. Um, there's many things that sort of contribute to this decrease that we've seen over the last decade plus. Then we have sort of the unique category of punishment, the death penalty, otherwise known as capital punishment here in the United States. Now, the death penalty is been part of America since our inception. Um, we brought the philosophy over from Europe. We've modified it to make it a, you know, its own American version that we'll be talking about the nuances of what make the death penalty in America very American. Um, but it's been part of America. Now, for most of you within your lifetime, you're probably aware of the fact that there's been a push to move away from capital punishment, to move away from the death penalty. And we'll see that with some of the numbers as even though it's still part of America, it's not nearly as popular or used as much as it was historically. Um, California, in fact, which hasn't even used the death penalty to fruition, hasn't executed anyone since I think 2006 or something like that. So it's been quite a while. We still have the death penalty on the books and we still have give or take roughly 740 inmates sitting on death row who are sentenced quote unquote to be executed but I don't see an execution coming anytime soon for these individuals and we'll talk about sort of the the repercussions of having individuals on death row even if there's no sort of plan to bring their punishment um, to conclusion at any point in time. So a couple other things that have happened over the last 50 years, give or take, in the United States have been some of the initial sort of like rallying pushes, good and bad, as far as the death penalty. The first that you should probably be familiar with is a case called Furman v. Georgia, 1972. Um, and this led to a the suspension of the death penalty across the entire United States. So at the federal level, all the way down, the death penalty was suspended in 1972 as a result of this particular case. And as often happens with a lot of legal cases, the actual facts and the rationale behind this goes more with sort of the technicalities of the cases. Um, the death penalty was suspended due to an argument of arbitrary and capricious rulings due to jury discretion. Um, in other words, one of the things that was brought up was that jur juries were not properly informed of all the repercussions of the, the death penalty. Um, we're not talked about, told enough about alternatives, um, about, we're not told about the severity of some of the, you know, handing down a death penalty, et cetera, et cetera, which led to Eighth Amendment issues. And we'll talk about arbitrary and capricious and Eighth Amendment things going forward. But Eighth Amendment, just to sort of give you a glimpse at it, is that, you know, the cruel and unusual punishment. No one should be subjected to cruel and unusual punishment and some of the technicalities of how cases were brought before juries, how juries decided cases that involving the potential for the death penalty uh, were found to be in certain violations of Eighth Amendment and therefore Furman v. Georgia suspended the death penalty in 1972. But as that pendulum swings back and forth, it didn't take long for another case to come forward. And sure enough, Greg v. Georgia in 1976, all of a sudden we saw the death penalty reinstated. And the bottom line was the individuals in the areas where they found that the jury instructions and the way that the trials proceeded when it came to a death case where there was issues, they revised the statutes. They revised how the cases were handled. They revised how juries were instructed and selected in order to sort of seal the gaps that were found and exposed in Furman v. Georgia. And sure enough, in 1976, we see the reinstatement of the death penalty. However, many states took the initial Furman v. Georgia as sort of the starting point to completely start going a different trajectory, to go down a different path and to start moving away from the death penalty. While other states, as soon as Greg v. Georgia was finalized, they were very eager to get back to using the death penalty. And we'll see some of the states and we'll talk more about that going forward. And one of the things here with Greg v. Georgia was by revising the statutes, they focus on sentencing guidelines for juries and judges, as well as a recognition of mitigation, mitigating and aggravating circumstances in certain cases. So when we look at executions over the last 90 plus years in the United States, let's just look at this first slide, then on the next slide, we'll, we'll 
catch pick up in 2008 move forward but as you can see here that even though there may be cries for the you know abolishing the death penalty or fear that we overuse the death penalty our numbers in the 2000s looked nothing like prior to the two Georgia cases um, prior to Furman v Georgia and Greg v Georgia in the 70s and that's why you see that the gap there in the 70s because that was when we had the um, the suspension of the death penalty but we go back to the 1930s 40s and 50s and you can see that the executions in the united states were well above 100 oftentimes um getting close to 200 um, per year um, and whereas since greg v georgia and the reinstatement of the death penalty in 1976 we saw a spike that sort of climbed to around 2000 and then we've seen changes a precipitous drop since and we look at the executions focusing solely on the era post Greg v. Georgia, what we see is a slow starting in the 70s as states started to reintroduce the death penalty. And then it became popular with tough on sentencing and mandatory minimums and other types of um, get tough approaches. And we saw it sort of peak at close to 100 executions right around 1999, 2000. But since then, we've seen a precipitous drop. Um, and it tends to sort of show the way that the pendulum and our sort of um, society is moving as far as our belief about the effectiveness and the appropriateness of the death penalty. And we see those declines. Now, are there still some, some states that use um, the death penalty more than others? Absolutely. Um, when we get to this later in the semester, we'll talk about states like Texas and Georgia um, and Alabama still use the death penalty um, quite a bit more than most other states. When we look at the prisoners on death row, we can see this is one of the problems. Although on the previous slide, we've seen that we're executing fewer and fewer individuals and instead probably giving them a life in prison sentence as opposed to executing them. We still, because of sort of the delay and um, laws that are still on the books but aren't being actually used or the punishment is not being carried out to totality, the problem is we're starting to see more and more individuals just sitting on death row, but sitting on death row, awaiting their appeals, awaiting their final decision on their execution, or in states like California, just sitting there because we have a hiatus. We're not using the death penalty right now, but yet we still have people that are being placed on death row. And as we'll talk about, housing an individual on death row is actually much more expensive than just housing somebody in general population in a prison setting. And finally, to wrap up this sort of introduction to the various forms of, of punishment within the correctional system, we have parole. Now, parole is the back end of community corrections. And people often confuse probation and parole. They both start with a P. <laughs> they both are a type of community correction, but that's about it. Um, and I want to make sure we are very clear about that. Parole is the back end. This is for individuals who have already served time in prison. And now they're allowed to be released back into society, but they're not just released with, you know, no limitations at all. They're released sort of slowly. So parole is the conditional release to community supervision, whether by parole board decision or by mandatory conditional release after serving a prison term. And offenders are subject to being returned to jail or prison for rule violations or other offenses. So we're, it's saying, okay, you've done your time, you've served your prison sentence, now it's time for us to free up space in that prison so the prison's not overcrowded, you no longer does need to be here, you've done, you know, you've met your requirements, but we still want to keep a close eye on you. And so we're going to release you back out into society with some requirements such as checking in with a parole officer, maybe getting, you know, showing proof of employment or stable residence, um, drug testing, engaging in various types of treatment, um, things of that nature. Um, so a lot of the requirements may look like probation, but it's clearly a distinctly different group of individuals, right? These are not, you know, individuals who have are first time offenders or have only done minor crimes and they're allowed to be in the community. No, parolees are individuals who have been to prison. So they've, you know, by and large are individuals who have been convicted of a felony and have actually served their time for it. And now they're slowly being reintroduced back into society.
So let's take a look at the numbers of individuals on parole. So in 2008, we had 826,000 U.S. adults, roughly, on parole. And by 2018, we saw an increase. So a big takeaway from this lecture is across the major categories of punishment in the United States, over the last you know, 10 to 13 years, give or take, the one category that we've actually seen an increase in has been parole. So we now, as of 2018, had 878,000 U.S. adults, which led to a little bit over a 6% increase of individuals on parole. And one of the reasons, especially here in California, we've seen that because we, 2007 and 2008, we were facing a major prison overcrowding crisis. Um, and as we'll talk about in a couple lectures on that, about the nuances and details of it, we needed to find a way to quickly reduce the prison population in California. And so from about 2009 until now, there have been sort of mandatory changes, there have been sentencing changes, there have been early release, there have been different sort of components in order to reduce the prison population, we have increased the number of people on parole. So we're actually shifting sort of the, the emphasis or the burden, if you want to call it, of correctional supervision. And this has happened in many other states across the U.S., which probably is one of the big reasons that, that contributes to this increase that we've seen during that time period. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up there for today and then we will continue on. And obviously for each of these types of correctional approaches, this will not be the last time we refer to them. This was simply sort of a, a broad brushstrokes overview of the various types of correctional approaches. And we will spend quite a few lectures going into much more detail about the history and nuances of each going forward. So take care, have a nice day.